So we're going to do a worked example for um, angular momentum and torques and, uh, sorry, angular um, inertia, rotational inertia, <laughs> angular acceleration and torques. Uh, and we're going to use a toy helicopter as an example. And you can see, hopefully, in my little picture that I've drawn here, that I've got my copter itself, the little wheel, um, and an axle that acts in the middle of the wheel. And hopefully you're familiar with these. You pull back the string and the helicopter pops off and floats away in the opposite direction, spinning as it goes. Now, because it's a toy helicopter, we're gonna be using some really small numbers here. Uh, we've got the radius of the axle, which is where the string is attached to it. Um, we've got a radius of our axle there, 1.5 centimeters. The helicopter itself, is only five centimetres um, in diameter, and we know it's only 25 grams. Now, we've asked first to calculate the rotational inertia. Now, to do that, we need to know how the mass is distributed. And luckily for us, we are told in the question, and in fact, we're usually told in the question, that we can assume that the mass is distributed around the outer edge. Now, we know that actually some of the mass is used to make these little struts and some of the mass makes the ring in the centre. But we're told, let's treat it like it's a hoop or a hollow cylinder of some kind. And we can use this formula because all the mass is concentrated in the radius. And when we work that out, so our mass times by the radius of the helicopter, that works out to be kilogram meters squared. Now, in this sort of in this sort of um, problem, the maths isn't an issue. The tricky bit, the one thing that might trip you up, is trying to decide which of these two radiuses to use. And so you have to have in your head all the time what the actual physical concept is. In our case, the actual physical concept is how um, what's the rotational inertia of our helicopter? We're not interested in the radius at, of the axle at the moment. We're going to ignore that. Now let's take this a step further and say, well, when we pull back on that string, what, the, what will the angular acceleration of our, um, our helicopter be? How fast will we cause it to change its angular velocity? And fortunately for us, we're told that the force on the string is 18 newtons. Now, I'm going to solve this in two steps. I'm going to say, well, I can't easily get from F to angular acceleration. But there is an intermediate step I can take. I know that the torque applied is equal to the force times the distance. Now I happen to have the force already, 18 newtons, and I have the distance as well, but it's disguised. You might not immediately spot it, though I hope you have. It's here, the radius of the axle. The 18 newtons of force is being applied here at the string, offset by the distance, the radius of the axle. That's our D in this case. And so 18 times 0.015, that happens to work out to be 0.27 Newton meters. So far, so good. We've worked out the torque. Our next step is to use Newton's second law, because once we know the torque and we already know the rotational inertia, we can use our rotational equivalent of F equals MA to find the angular acceleration. And we know that torque also equals uh, rotational inertia times by angular acceleration. And we can rearrange that to get angular acceleration equals torque divided by rotational inertia. Sorry, I'm running out of room here on the table, so I'm just going to put it next to it. And it just so happens when we do that and work it out, we get an answer of 4,320 radians per second squared. Or at least I hope we do. I hope I haven't made a mathematical error. But that's our technique. So you can see 
we've been able to apply um, our new knowledge using our existing understanding in a new way of thinking.